The Latin word sanctio originally meant a decision made by the clergy, and later referred to any punishment administered on wrongdoers. Voiding a drunk driver's license, fining a negligent employee, or grounding a child for bad behavior. Each of these is an example of a sanction. Today, we're more interested in the international sanctions that nations impose upon each other. Yet they follow the same logic. If you misbehave, you're grounded. Your economic partnerships are limited, your bank accounts frozen, and joint initiatives halted. Step by step, you're being conditioned to behave better. It has happened repeatedly throughout history. For instance, the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I required Germany to pay a colossal sum of money in reparations and limit its military development. Sanctions were imposed upon North Korea for conducting nuclear tests and Belarus for the repression of its people by President Lukashenko. Unfortunately, these measures don't always work as intended. Hitler refused to pay reparations when he rose to power and instead increased arms production. Soon after, the world was plunged into a second, even more devastating war. The humiliating terms of the Treaty of Versailles did not deter the aggressor, but on the contrary, they united a nation in support of the Fuhrer. The effect of sanctions on Belarus and North Korea aren't working any better. Thankfully, war hasn't broken out yet, but there are no regime changes on the horizon. Why is that? You see, no nation is a single entity unified by a common will. It comprises a leader, elites, and millions of citizens with all sorts of interests, all teeming with internal conflict and contradiction. But when sanctions are imposed against a nation, they become a unifying factor. And as expected, the authorities fire up their propaganda machines to implore, they're attacking us, we're surrounded, time to forget our differences and unite against the common threat. Any hope that a regime would eventually run out of money for war and repression rarely comes to fruition. You see, the more cannibalistic the authorities get, the less they care about the well-being of their citizens. Trusted elites will enjoy their privileges no matter what. Law enforcement will benefit too, while the citizens are bled dry. They don't struggle to find a reason because the sanctions are to blame. With this understanding in mind, the sanctions imposed on Russia for the annexation of Crimea were actually a gift for Putin. They helped him do something he had been attempting for almost 15 years, to persuade Russians that the West is hostile. This isn't the time for regime change, there's an enemy at the gates, and certainly not the time to nitpick new laws, we're under siege. Of course, the Kremlin gang was happy about the opportunity to steal more than they ever had before. So are sanctions ineffective? Yes and no. If you indiscriminately oppose sanctions on an entire country, you're likely to hit the most vulnerable parts of society who are already suffering at the hands of their own government. They also empower regimes to be even more dangerous. There are, however, other types of sanctions, which target specific people and projects close to the regime. Let's take a look at how Putin's regime works. Any kleptocratic dictatorship works this way. They're all surprisingly similar. There's the leader, being close to whom means getting rich. Secondly, there are the trusted ones who serve the regime in exchange for a life of luxury for themselves and their families. The trusted ones never send their kids to study at local universities, never buy real estate in their hometowns, and never spend their vacations at Russian resorts. Instead, they steal, invest, and spend abroad, indulging in the comforts of Western democratic societies. Russia is simply their free resource supply. Finally, there's Putin's money, stored in the accounts of his childhood friends and old colleagues, such as Colbin the Butcher or Raldugan the Cellist. Their meteoric career advances mysteriously coincided with their old friend being elected president. Their accounts aren't in Russia either, of course. The West is currently ignoring this. Who would say no to an influx of money? But there's money, and then there's money. When it's dirty, it's closely followed by corruption. Businessmen controlled by the Kremlin become tools of influence for operations abroad. Putin uses them to corrupt and blackmail European officials and spread misinformation. Over time, the threat becomes increasingly severe. To make sanctions work, they have to be made personal. Being a friend of Putin must also mean isolation, frozen accounts, and closed borders, not a life of luxury. 
they must be forced to enjoy the benefits of the country which they've robbed. Who and what should be targeted for these sanctions? First, the highest level officials of the authoritarian regime, including the so-called systematic liberals. Putin relies on them for power, thus their specific views and beliefs should not matter. Do you work for the regime? Are you an accomplice to those who rob Russia? That is reason enough. Second are those who enforce illegal orders and political repressions. Judges, security officials, prosecutors, and the special services, when caught red-handed. Third, the sponsors of this regime, the courtier billionaires and Putin's walking wallets. Finally, projects, disguised as economic or cultural development, but which are intended for political pressure, corruption, and the suppression of civil rights and freedom. Those sanctions would only benefit the average Russian citizen. After all, isn't their money siphoned across the border year after year? The same money that buys elite villas and luxury yachts, sponsors the regime, and is used to corrupt Western officials. When the regime falls, those assets will make their way back to Russia, as has been the case with other deposed dictators. So, when you hear anti-Russian sanctions, check which ones are being mentioned. If they describe personal sanctions against Putin's friends, you'll know they're actually pro-Russian, the best possible kind. Have a nice day.